Hello everyone, this is James Shore with another Test Driven Development video. I hope everybody had a great Christmas. Uh, this is the first session I'm recording since I got back from my vacation. It is December 29th, and the last time I recorded, I think, was December 9th. It's been quite a while. And um, so it's going to take me a few minutes to get back into it. But as I recall, what we were doing was this... Uh, we had the application running. Actually, let's go ahead and bring that up. Okay, so there's our application, and we do have it working with some actual values now, um, but what we don't have is any sort of error handling, and um, it really doesn't like that. So we need to get that in there. Yeah, if we make the numbers too big, there's all kinds of problems here. Um, and that's okay. That's that's what I expect at this point. So that is next on our list. Now on my website, on the comments on this video, DF Jones asked um, what I meant by expansion and contraction cycles. And I mentioned this I think in one of the recap videos that most of you don't watch. And what I mean is that there's the normal cycle as I work of test-driven development you know, write, uh, think about what to do next, write a test that's going to force that code to be written, write the code, refactor, do that in really small, fast cycles. Um, a larger cycle that I see is one of expansion and contraction, where I'll spend some time adding in code to make a new feature work, and I'll do the best quality code I know how for whatever it is I'm working on, but the broader design of the application will actually get a little bit crufty. There'll be just these things that pop up that aren't strictly necessary in order to get whatever I'm working on right at the moment done, but this just sort of add up. Like this thing right here where I need to add, have dollars equal compared to null. Questions like whether or not stock market here should be immutable. Um, little glitches in terms of how everything fits together. Those build up as you add new features and for me at least, I don't want to take time away from whatever it is I'm working on right this moment to solve those. So uh, I'll go through a cycle of expansion where I'll add a new feature, and then I'll have to come back and take care of these and clean up the design. So that's why, and that's that tends to make the design smaller, it tends to make it cleaner, a little more clear. Uh, so I call that a contraction cycle. So, and this happens you know, throughout the day. Uh, I would say an expansion cycle usually goes for a couple of hours and then a contraction cycle will usually go for a couple of hours or maybe a little less. I've never measured it, so I can't say for sure. So, uh, DF Jones, that's what I meant about uh, expansion and contraction cycles. There is a larger cycle that we don't see here because the application's too young, and that is um, about once a week, maybe every couple of weeks, uh, maybe multiple times a week, I will need to do a more concerted effort in terms of code cleanup where class responsibilities are no longer making sense. So I'll need to combine classes or split classes or something like that. Uh, that's a more aggressive refactoring than even what we're seeing here. And then what I've seen on projects that I've done from scratch is that over the course of a couple of months, the overall architecture starts getting a little crufty. Um, you either discover new ways of doing things or your initial ideas turned out to be inappropriate for the problem you have or maybe it was just too simple or maybe it was too complicated. Actually, often uh, in the early days my architectural ideas were too complicated and I would identify ways of making them simpler uh, over a couple of months. So there's another cycle that happens uh, that every couple of months I'll identify new architectural approaches and start putting those in, in place as well. And by architecture, I mean the broad patterns of the application, like how you handle persistence and you know the way your business objects relate to other layers and so forth. So um, lots of cycles, I think, in programming. The little cycle of test-driven development is what makes it all go. But then everything beyond that is just keeping the design really clean. And I think it's really important to keep the design clean, but it's also really important not to stress too much about it, um, which is why... I talk about you know allowing things to be messy until you have a good idea about how to fix it because 
as long as you pay attention to those ideas, they will come along. So anyway, um, sorry to wax philosophical on you all. Um, I do think that a lot of people just do the initial expansion and never do the contraction cycles, the daily cleanup, the weekly class responsibility rejiggering, and the quarterly architectural refactorings. I think people leave those alone because it's way more fun to do expansion than contraction unless you're kind of OCD like I am and really want things to be clean and neat. If you don't have that tendency or if you're under a lot of schedule pressure, um, you tend not to do that. And that's where technical debt comes from. That's where bad code comes from. That's where, you know, legacy, that's how legacy code is born. Test-driven development does not prevent legacy code. Um, although Michael Feathers has a great definition of TDD as code that's without tests. I don't think that's true. Legacy code is code that's hard to change, are badly designed, extremely frustrating to work with. Um, and my friend Arlo Bell, she calls that indebted code rather than legacy code. Anyway, indebted code is code that's difficult to change, and that happens when you don't pay attention to keeping the design clean. And TDD gives you the tests that make it possible to refactor and change the design, but it's not going to make the design clean. TDD is great. It's fantastic. It's not a panacea. It doesn't solve all problems. You still have to pay attention to your assumptions and making sure you don't have bugs from other sources than programmer error, uh, you know, coding error, really. And you have to work on keeping your design clean. TDD just makes it easier. It doesn't solve all problems. And that's, a, that's it for my soapbox. I've wasted half the episode on it. Great question, uh, DF Jones. I think, uh, is that Danny Jones who did my HD code? If so, thank you very much for that as well. Uh, my HD video YouTube code. Anyway, thanks for your question. And I'm, let's do some programming. So what we need to do is this text parsing. That's an application frame. So let's go ahead and pull that up. Okay, so, yeah, right now, we just do our stuff right here. And what we could do, I'm not going to write a test around this because I'm just going to experiment for a moment. Um, what we could do is say that what is this, the text parse exception? Maybe it's just a parse exception. Yeah, we could just catch a, whoa, parse exception. You know, I think I'd use the autocomplete more often if it worked the way I expect it to. <laughs> you know, if things don't work exactly the way I think it is, it's wrong. Um, so, we could do something like this where we basically ignore, wow, I am rusty, um, what? What is going on here? Oh, a number format exception. Okay. Um, sorry about that. So I could just catch a number format exception. Ugh, my fingers are cold. I'm having work done in my office, so I have to work in a different place than normal. Um, and it's really affecting my typing. Okay. So sorry about that. That took way longer than it should have. So I could do this, and what this will result in is everything working just fine. But you know what? Except when I get to be too long. Oh, even that's working because 
because it's too big to be an integer. I wonder what would happen. What's the maximum integer? 24 billion? Huh. Look at that. I thought that was bigger than a max int. Um, interesting. Yeah, there we go. Um, anyway, so I could do that, but I don't really, I mean, you know, without the, without the print statement. And that would be okay, but I'd rather do something much nicer than that. What I'd like to do is actually have a custom text field that is just for entering dollars. Um, one, I think that will be a better way of handling this code. Two, I have a strong feeling that we're going to use it anyway. Although, you know, following the you aren't going to need it principle, you don't want to design for stuff that you think you might need, even though, you know, in this case it's pretty obvious I will need more than one of these. I can't, I don't need it right now, I'm just doing the one. But even though I'm only doing one right now, I think it would be improved design to have a custom you know, dollars text field or something like that. So that's what I was thinking is that I'd make a dollars text field and then that I can program to filter out illegal characters like letters and so forth. So I'm going to pause the video for a moment, do a little research and be back. Okay, I'm back. So I'm looking at this and J formatted text field looks like the appropriate thing here. Um, and it's fairly complicated. So I think what I want to do is do a little spike on this and try to figure it out and we'll see how that goes. Well, that's all the time I have, and so I will finish this spike up in the next video. Thanks everybody for watching. I will see you next time.